uh, Cory Booker, and I'm really pleased to be here. This day is extraordinary and historic. Uh, I'm honored that Vice President Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have centered uh, this issue of awareness and action around maternal health, uh, not only in policy in general, but really uh, through executive action and through what I believe will be one of the greatest pieces of legislation in American history to build back better uh, uh, policies, to build back better bill. And so I know this has been mentioned uh, throughout the summit, but I want to reemphasize it here on this particular panel, that we are the wealthiest nation in the world, but have the shameful distinction of having the highest maternal mortality rates amongst wealthy nations. The majority of those deaths are preventable. And more than that, we see amidst these healthcare disparities uh, that make it even worse for uh, women of color uh, with two to three times higher rates of black and brown women dying uh, than majority women. And so this is a shameful reality. Uh, it is a national shame. Uh, but uh, as was said by a previous president, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be solved with what's right with America. And I'm grateful, again, that there are congressional leaders and others who are rolling up the sleeves, their sleeves to do something about this. In my entire career in the Senate, this has been uh, one of my focuses. And I'm very proud that a lot of the policies I've worked on with Kamala Harris when she was then Senator Harris, as well as some great House members like Lauren Underwood, Alma Adams, Ayanna Presley that we put together some really great bills like the Mommies Act, uh, which would expand, extend postpartum Medicaid coverage uh, from just 60 days to an entire year uh, from other issues like the help, uh, Maternal Health Momnibus Act, uh, which is a comprehensive maternal health legislation, uh, again, championed by vi the vice president, uh, that these two bills and components of it are really close uh, to being law in the Build Back Better plan. And so now you might be asking yourself that uh, why is a male senator uh, talking about these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, why has it been center at the center of my policy agenda since I came to the United States Senate? Well, I'll be very clear. Uh, this is not an issue uh, just for women. This is an issue for all of us. Uh, if we believe in the fundamental ideals of this nation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if we believe that uh, the health of our children and mothers are sacrosanct to our ideas uh, of a successful nation, then we all have to be concerned about these issues. And so I believe uh, that we all have to be champions along with doulas and midwives, community workers, activists, healthcare professionals, uh, because when it comes to all of our success, uh, our children and birthing people have to be at the center. And so I'm grateful uh, that today we have in this panel uh, two individuals who have a tremendous testimony, who share with me this core purpose, and in many ways have turned their own personal pain uh, into a life purpose. Uh, I'd like to introduce and thank our panelists specifically now uh, for joining us in this discussion. And they're Charles Johnson and Alexis Ohanian. Um, and I wanna say, Charles, uh, I would really like it if you could introduce yourself and maybe share your really compelling testimony with folks that are watching. Sure, absolutely. Senator Booker, first and foremost, let me just thank you. Um, because, you know, I was really just had a heavy heart this morning, just thinking about this journey that I've been in on this advocacy road for almost five years. And far before um, the issue of maternal wellness and maternal health had hit the mainstream, you have been a champion out here. I remember coming to Congress in 2017 when I first started advocating, and nobody would even take meetings with me. But your staff uh, welcomed us with open arms. You were championing legislation even back then. But to be here standing arm in arm with you on the verge of this unprecedented legislation that is gonna change and impact not only mothers today, but far after we're gone, I'm extremely grateful. So um, I know it was a mouthful, but it was important. It was important. So uh, I'm Charles Johnson. I'm the founder of Four Cure for Moms, which is a uh, organization committed to ending the maternal mortality crisis. But um, how I ended up here was I was fortunate enough, um, you know, Alexis and Senator Booker to meet a woman that absolutely changed my life, right? And so when we talk about my wife here, we're talking about a woman that spoke five languages fluently, that raced cars, that was a skydiver. And, you know, honestly, she was, truth be told, way out of my league, right? 
And um, I always wanted to be a dad. And so we welcomed our first son in 2014. We always talked about how cool it would be to have back-to-back -back boys, right? And we found that we welcomed our second son in 2016. We were over the moon. And so on April 12th of 2016, um, we walked into Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, California, what we expected to be the happiest day of our lives. And we walked straight into a nightmare. Um, and I know, Alexis, you can relate, right, that anticipation of being a father, right, especially for the first time, right, it's this amazing, this overwhelming joy, but a little bit anxious, and so our son was born perfectly healthy, um, and they took us back to recovery, and that's when things took a turn for the worse, and as Kira's sitting there resting, and our new baby is sitting there resting, I look down by Kira's bedside, and I begin to see blood coming from her catheter, her Foley catheter, and I brought it to the attention of the doctors and the nurses at Cedars, um, and they came in and they examined Kira. And this is around four o'clock in the, in the afternoon. And um, they ordered a series of tests. Um, in the interest of time, I know I want to get to what I know is going to be an incredibly robust discussion. But what happened over the next 12 hours is Kira was allowed to bleed internally while myself, my family begged and pleaded for them to take action, begged and pleaded for them to go take her for a CT scan that they said they would take that they ordered at five o'clock. Five o'clock came, six o'clock came, seven o'clock came. They didn't take her back to surgery until after midnight. And that CT scan never took place. And by the time they took her back to surgery and they opened her up, there were three liters of blood in her abdomen for which she'd been allowed to bleed and suffer needlessly while my family and myself begged for them to simply just hear her concerns. Um, and so that afternoon, we walked into Cedar Sinai Hospital, we thought that my wife would not walk out to raise her boys. It never crossed my mind. Um, but as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, I began to hear stories of other women with horrific birthing experiences and other women that were losing their lives. And I began to think to myself, something just isn't right. And that's when I began to do the research myself. And I came to understand what we all know here today is that we are in the midst of a maternal mortality crisis, as you said, that's shameful, not only domestically, but it's shameful globally. And so for the past four and a half years, I've committed my life to doing everything I can, although there's nothing we can do to bring Kira back. Um, I owe it to her. I owe it to my boys. I owe it to all the other mothers that have lost their lives. Um, giving the ultimate gift of birth to everything we can to make sure we send other mothers home with their precious babies. I mean, Charles, th that, that story is painful uh, to hear. And the, 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 the beauty that is coming out of it is that Kira was a Kira's great woman and her legacy of love lives on through you and her sons. Thank and you so much. yeah, to take your pain and turn it into purpose is something that to me is just extraordinary. So I'm, 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 really, I'm really grateful for you. Alexis, will you introduce yourself, man, and and uh, uh, tell tell your story as well? Sure. Well, look, it uh, again. Thank you for convening this. Um, I feel like I got a window uh, into something uh, that I never would have otherwise gotten. Uh, most people know me for creating Reddit. Uh, I run a venture capital firm now called Seven Seven Six, but. Um, this became a very personal issue because my wife, who um, is yeah, Serena Williams, uh, you would expect, you know, with all the, the access we have, um, with all the advantages we have would be getting, you know, best in class care. And, and the, the glimpse I got in, especially as a, as a white dude who, <laughs> you know, every, everyone listens to who always gets the, the benefit of the doubt in any situation who, who's had a, a ton of privilege basically everywhere I go. I got a window window into something that um, absolutely affected me and, and has made this such an important issue for me ever since. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty well documented, but when uh, Serena went in to give birth to our daughter, Olympia, birth went fine. And then sure enough, afterwards, um, she has a history of pulmonary embolisms and um, ended up having uh, a couple there in the hospital, some emergency surgeries. And, and, and really the, the punchline here is she had to diagnose herself right. and she had to say to the doctors, this like specifically the drugs, these are the drugs I need. This is, this is what I need right now. And as a husband in that moment, you want to do everything you can 
for your wife. And it is a surreal feeling to be in these situations and not be able to get people to listen, not be able to get people to act, even when you're sitting here as someone who, you know, you're very used to having people listen to you. Um, and you're with a woman who, you know, is, is a superhero. Um, to, to see how close she was, in spite of all the advantages we have, um, to see how close she was to, to, to passing, it was uh, a humbling and a grounding experience. And, and it, was, it was only after she shared her story publicly that we started to educate ourselves and learn you know, a lot about all this great work Charles has been doing and, and others to, to raise awareness on this issue. There is a, a shameful uh, black maternal health crisis in particular in this country that uh, that we, we need to do so much better on. And it's part of the reason I've become such an advocate for paid family leave as well, because yes. I don't want any American man or woman to have to decide between being in the NICU or the ICU and their job, right? That no man, no person should have to make that decision, man or woman ever between their family during these precious moments in their career. So just grateful to be here. Um, I know I'm going to learn a lot too. And uh, well, you, you say that humbly because uh, we all know your platform and you use it really to educate folks on on a few things. Number one, maternal mor mor morbidity or what we might also call near misses, even as mm. was in your case. Mm. This is serious. It's affecting 50,000 to 60,000 uh, uh, pregnant people a year. So this is not something that is uh, uh, an anomaly. This is happening to tens of thousands of families going through what you went through, and then the epidemic of women not being believed and listened to right. um, is just stunning. And we find that often across, uh, especially for Black women, across uh, educational spectrums mm -hmm. to economic spectrums, it is a real issue. And then uh, the, the finally, the, the importance of paid family leave, which you've really become such a loud voice, it is, it is a connected part of what's going on. As we know, a lot of these complications don't occur in the immediate aftermath, as it did with the two of you, uh, two of your your uh, spouses, but often a month later, two months later, three months later, or more. So, so I just I'm grateful for using your 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 platform as you do and being unapologetic about advancing a cause that doesn't have a partisan tinge to it. It's about our it's about birthing people. It's about women. It's about our healthy children. And hey, yeah. Charles, I think there's a dynamic of this that we don't talk about enough, sure. which is what is the impact of not just we center ourselves on Kira and the women that we've lost, but we don't take that next step of empathy to understand what this does to a family uh, in terms of uh, uh, child care and raising children and the trauma that often follows with that and how that, that, that trauma doesn't, isn't just something that you feel and then it's gone. It often lives with, with children and, and, and families. And I'm wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit about um, what government and other stakeholders can be doing really to support families and what's really going on with families that suffer this kind of loss. No, absolutely. And I, I thank you so much for just bringing that up because that is something that often is overlooked. Um, and one thing there's, you know, as I, you know, am on this journey, there's so many things I'm still trying to figure out. But one of the things I'm crystal clear about, Senator Booker, is that nothing can replace a mother, nothing. And that's one of the things, you know, we see the, you know, we hear about the data, we hear about the statistics, but like I've said, oftentimes there's no statistic that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18 month old that his mother's never coming home, right? There's no like point in your algorithm that can try and quantify, you know, trying to explain to a son that will never know their mother just how amazing she was. And I was talking to a friend last night who reached out to me and he said, uh, you know, Charles, don't hold anything back. And in that spirit, I'll share with everybody here today. And even just last night, you know, my boys are now um, five and seven years old. These are little guys. <laughs> oh, guys right there. They're new five and seven. All right. And um, they're just amazing little dudes, right? And I'm so blessed. They're smart and they're thriving, but still there are moments and literally just last night after dinner, as we're sitting there, um, just preparing to get ready to go to bed, my youngest son Langston asked me, he said, Daddy, where's mommy? And I kind of just, you kind of take one of those, because there's a conversation that we've had. And I explained to him again that, you know, 
mommy is in heaven. You know, she's an angel and she's doing important work. And he says, well, but she's supposed to come home after 60 days. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, they told me that she's supposed to come back. The people who are in the sky are supposed to come back after 60 days. And I said, well, who said that? And he said, that's what they told me. And now at this point, it doesn't matter where he heard that or how he rationalized that, or if he got it from YouTube or he heard it from friends at school. I'm sitting here face to face with a five-year-old who is somehow latched on to some hope or possibility that his mother's gonna walk through that door. And I have to disappoint him all over again and explain to him that that's not gonna happen. And so these impacts of these mothers, all these mothers that we are losing are precious gifts and so critical to these communities. And so I think that it's important that as a nation that we are supporting not only immediate family, but the, the extended family with the resources they need, helping them with childcare. I'm fortunate that I have a tremendous extended family that's rallied around me. But what if you're like some friends that I know that have lost their wives that have their hourly workers, their hourly construction workers, and have to make that choice between caring for that precious child and going to work, making sure that they have the grief, the grief counseling support necessary to make sure that they recover and that they have the tools that they need to get their life back on track. Um, I think that those are all things that we can do to make sure that we're supporting these families. Yeah, I, I tell you, you, it's just hard not to get emotional when you're talking about that because I'm immediately thinking about the role my mom played. You know, she was there for taking me to school, uh, packing lunches, teacher visits, all, all of those things. Plus, she was a, a co-earner with my dad, right? And who had a different kind of job that took him away a lot more, so he couldn't do a lot of those domestic things. And then I also think about those single moms who go to the hospital and know they're going to be raising these kids alone, and then they die. And what 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 kind of where do those children fall in terms of a family support network? So, this is this is real, and it's. Um, and it's uh, it's difficult, and and that's why the silence about this issue has allowed it to become such a major problem in America. And Alexis, you you are doing such a profound job confronting the silence, bringing these issues to the fore. And um, I I think technology is. I've always said this. I was an early adapter uh, on a lot of social media. It's like a mountain range. You know, there are peaks, towering peaks of possibility with technology. There are definitely valleys we all know about. But I'm wondering you as a tech person who's trying to use technology uh, to show the future, to be a democratizing force, a force of awareness, a force to create community. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when it comes to the tech industry, what, what can be they be doing uh, to really focus on maternal health and eliminating these disparities in maternal health. Well, look, and I, I do, I want to stress as much as I believe in technology and entrepreneurship to help make this better. Government absolutely does have a role to play. So I, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Um, I do, I do think fem tech that is technology around women and particularly women's health is a huge, huge opportunity. It's just starting to get the investment it deserves. And I think over the next 10 years, our fund in particular is going to be investing literally millions, tens of millions of dollars into these types of companies, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because I actually think there's a lot of amazing entrepreneurs who are going to build very successful businesses out of them. Um, and, and what's interesting and, and probably a little sad is more often than not, you have women and, and in particular women of color who because they've gotten so frustrated with the inadequacies of our uh, system that have gone out and said, okay, I'm just going to build something better. Um, and this was the case of one CEO we backed uh, named Simone Tate who said, I'm going to build, it's called Poppy Seed Health. Because of my own birthing experience, I'm going to build a platform for 24-7 text-based support um, so that any any woman can get access to a, a doula, midwife, nurse, basically on demand for all the things they need as soon as they realize they're pregnant all the way through uh, birth and then beyond. And, and I do think in the best case scenario, you're going to have entrepreneurs who out of necessity will build better systems that are going to create equitable solutions to help give more women access to resources they wouldn't otherwise have. Because software can do that. 
technology can democratize access, can make things much cheaper and more accessible. Um, and, and I do think has an important role to play. Uh, the, the, the challenge though is gonna be, you know, these solutions can't come fast enough. And these are solutions that are still in their infancy. I think, I think in 10 years, this sector is going to look very obvious. It is gonna have, uh, it's gonna employ a lot of people. It's gonna generate a, a lot of great value and wealth, but uh, you know, we don't have that kind of time. And, and the sooner we get solutions that are actually helping uh, American women, the better. Amen, amen. Charles, you are, uh, I, I look at you also as like this foot soldier of the movement. You know, there, there are people who were beaten down, suffered tragedy from Mamie Till and another movement, right. uh, good families of Goodman, Shane Schwarners, people who suffered awful tragedy, but turned their tragedy uh, towards triumph, towards obtaining triumph. And I, I love this, uh, that you, uh, through your work, um, that there are like important pieces that are really have been at the center of your advocacy, including uh, the Kira Johnson Act. And I was wondering if you can uh, talk to us about the Kira Johnson Act and why it in particular is significant. Yeah, I, um, I'm just so grateful to be working in partnership with all of you all, and in particular, um, you know, the entire Black Maternal Health Caucus. And I just remember getting the call from Representative Lauren Underwood that they wanted to name a bill after Kira. And it was just, um, it's such a tremendous honor and just an, uh, a wonderful way to, uphold her legacy, but the, this, this act in particular is something that we're really proud of. It's gonna do several things that are really important. It's gonna award funding to community-based um, women-led organizations of color, which really speaks to directly what Alexis was saying. So we're gonna be funding community-based organizations that are on the front line, supporting families, catching the babies who really historically haven't had access, so many of them, to federal funding to give them the resources they need to better serve families. Um, it's gonna take important steps to diversify the perinatal workforce, right? Um, and then we're gonna take very, very critical steps towards better patient accountability and transparency by providing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create um, what are called um, dignified standard of care compliance offices that are gonna be within hospitals yet independent of hospitals. So if you're in an instance like um, Alexis and his family or other families so who are so often found in situations where they are faced with challenges and they have instances where they feel neglected, where they feel discriminated against, where they feel like their um, cries for help aren't answered, they're going to have a place to report those instances within that hospital that's going to be independent from that hospital. And then the federal government will have an opportunity to publish that data. So it's going to take Amen. important steps towards accountability and transparency. And we're really proud of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it too, man, because I felt like we were in the wilderness like four or five years ago with yeah. not seeing a pathway to getting this done. Now we're, you know, we're on the goal line and what you're outlining, are, it will make a real difference. I, I still find it, uh, Alexis, just like when I read your testimony about Serena literally getting up out of bed and, and demanding the specific name of the drug. I mean, that story was powerful. And then when they finally gave her the CT as she was insisting that she got, um, and, and so this is like, this is vindication, some of this that you, that we all together have been able to get help get done. But Alexis, there, there, there is that issue we've already touched on that I just want to push back on you because it, it's almost like stunning. I mean, just if you're living in Montana, in Detroit, just like a mile up in Canada, women up there have mm. a long family leave, but if you're a single mom, you know, and who's just given birth and having pain and 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 complications, you're being forced back into the workplace at a time that could really risk your health. Where, or not to mention if you have a prenatal birth and a, of a child, complications. Right. Not to mention that even if it's just a a a a, a, a childbirth without complication, this mm -hmm. idea that we wouldn't give that kind of fundamental time of bonding uh, at the beginning of a child's life. And so you've written about this, you've spoken out about this, you did a powerful editorial about this. I'm wondering if you can uh, spike the football on this point for us uh, a little bit and just drive home why you're outraged uh, and, and what the key drivers to your thought process are. You know, the word that comes to mind is barbaric. And, and the statistic that makes me feel that way is the one that today in America, one in four, women will be back to work two weeks after giving birth. 
and consider that some number of those women had complications, had even C-sections. C-sections are a real surgery, right? I uh, most of uh, the 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 parental duties after Olympia was born around our house because of the C-section and other surgeries Serena had fell on my shoulders. I I can't imagine the women who don't have anywhere close to the resources that we had having to endure that. And so, yeah, it's barbaric to think that in the United States, one in four women are back to work in two weeks after giving birth. That alone should make every American, even the senators in West Virginia, Mm -hmm. sit up and think, not in my country, right? If you actually care about American families, that should not, that should not happen. Full stop. And, and I, I think, you know, this, this paid family live issue is one that I candidly didn't even think about as I know, look, this is often the case uh, until it affected me. Wow. And, and it was something we offered at our company um, because our head of people and culture, uh, the amazing woman, Caitlin Holloway said, Hey, look, if you want to attract and retain the best talent, you need to have this. And I thought about it as a business decision. Of course. Okay, great. We want the best talent. We, they, that's what they demand. Great. They're going to have it. And then it was after, you know, Olympia was due that I realized, all right, let me take advantage of it. Let me set an example for other men in the organization. Um, because I do think it's important that, that if we de-risk uh, this idea, you know, there are so many men who are too afraid to even take advantage of it. If they're lucky enough to even have access, that we need to change the culture around that. Um, and, and I think it has a ripple effect. Uh, it, is, it is clear that offering this time isn't just good for building the family unit isn't just good for you know being decent uh and not having to force someone to choose between their family and their and their job um but we know it leads to better health outcomes for the child for the mother it it is it is absolutely long overdue and and the the thing i also just need to touch on too is um, i the the things like the care johnson act play such an important role because we are trying to unwind a system that again for someone who looks like me i i have blind spots to this and it's it's only through the relationship i've had really now with with my life my wife for the last four or five years that i start to really see it and 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 this is not to say these are nurses or doctors who are themselves racist per se it's not it's not that these are these are these are people trying to do spiteful wrong things but these are systems that are fundamentally flawed and have been broken for a very long time. And it is just so crucial, especially at a time that is so vulnerable for so many people. We, 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 we should absolutely find space to want better outcomes for, for newborn children and their families. Like if we can't all agree that this is an issue that we should all be fighting for, that should be bipartisan. I, 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 I I can't even fathom that because this is the the sort of most basic fundamental human thing, right? Right. This is creating new life and and bringing it in this world and and trying to undo even just a fraction of the inequity that exists in our society um, to to give a a newborn a shot and their family a shot. So I, this stuff is all interconnected and I do think the tide is going to turn and and whether or not a, a Senator from West Virginia wants his legacy to be stopping something this obvious and this important, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, but I'm, I'm still optimistic. I I know it's not a question of if it's a question of when we'll get paid family leave for all Americans, uh, just would like it to be as soon as possible. Hallelujah. So, so look, you guys, um, you spiked the football by the way, and, uh, and did some, did some finger pointing too, which was, which was uh, very, very Uh, NFL like of you. Let me wrap up fellas. Look, (laughs) the two of you have, uh, in my opinion, uh, been important in this national conversation because you force fellas, you force guys to understand this is not a women's issue, this is our issue. You also have been using your own gifts to to explode this further into the national conversation. And so I wanna say thank you both. I also wanna say, God bless Joe Biden, God bless Kamala Harris. Uh, This is why we elected them. Not to do what is the political flavor of the moment, but to, 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 to change lives. Uh, to elevate life, to save lives. And you said this is a, a bipartisan issue. It's a nonpartisan issue, actually. This is just mm. about people. Well, this, yeah. Politics should not be, we as a society should end this shameful reality, and we are close to doing it, I think, with the legislation we put in place on the federal level. States like mine, New Jersey, God bless Phil Murphy, are jumping way ahead in this space as well and getting real things done. There is a movement going on. 
you two are foot soldiers on that movement. I want to thank you. I want to wrap up just by saying uh, again, thank you, Kamala Harris, for showing the truth on this in the in the in the Senate and for leading in on the White House. We're going to get this done together. We, as a community, we as a country, are going to rise on up. Oh, Absolutely. wait a minute! I was getting a signal. You got that, the signal. Uh, that I was getting a signal. But I, yeah, I was getting the plays call from the sideline, okay. telling the guy on the field. Um, I I wonder if I got a few more. Do I have a few more minutes? Can I buy a minute or two? Hmm. Just a minute. So I'm going to give up my minute. I'm going to let you two have the final word. Alexis, 30 seconds, and then Charles, 30 seconds. I'd love to know uh, uh, any any particularized message for men who who again don't might not see this as an issue. Hmm. All right, I, I want to make sure that Charles, you get the last word. So. I, I will say, at the very least, you probably have a woman in your life who you care about. I really hope so. If you don't, I feel very sorry for you. But at the very least, consider them and consider them in their most vulnerable and, and consider them at a moment when they should be at their happiest and, and want to do right by them by supporting maternal health. And, and, and even if somehow you lack any kind of empathy, there is still a much better society in store for us uh, as long as we protect uh, women and, and the, the health of moms. Um, it is a more productive society. It is a more successful economically society. Um, there are lots of reasons, even if you lack all empathy, to want to support this. Uh, but fortunately, I think most of the people listening actually do care. And, yeah. and this is something that we have every right to, to fight for just as loudly, even though it doesn't affect us, um, we, we should care just as much, if not more, because chances are yeah. you, you had a mama and, yeah. and you should at least do right and honor her. Amen. Charles, yeah. take us home, man. Let's take it home. So yeah. uh, I, I'm going to pick up where Alexis dropped off. And that's right. You have a mama. And like we talk about this being a nonpartisan issue. There's two types of people in our country. Either you are a mama or you got one, right? Then beyond that, I think that we talk about the role of men in being able to talk about this crisis in a historical context, two things come to mind. It's one, it is um, advocacy. So making sure that you are tapping into resources so that you can make sure that you are informed and you are empowered to make sure that your partner, whoever it is that you care about, whether it's your sister, comes and is able to thrive before, during, and after childbirth. So to make sure that you understand you know, how to support them, what post-birth warning signs are, what signs of postpartum depression are. All those resources sources are readily available. You can tap in with us at 4 for momscom There's wonderful organizations out there. And then the next thing that I have to say that's critically important is responsible allyship, right? And so we have to, as men, um, use our privilege and our voice to not dominate this conversation, but to lift up and amplify the amazing work of women that are doing this. Um, and so I have to give deference to the women that were doing this work before I even knew there was a problem, right? All the doulas on the front line, all the birth workers, all the OBs, all the policy workers that have been working and screaming from the mountaintops that we have a problem in the United States. And so it's up to us as men to be responsible allies in this fight and not to dominate this conversation, but make sure we're doing everything we can to amplify and empower those voices. So it's advocacy and responsible allyship as men when we show up. Fellas, I, I sincerely love you guys. My mom has a saying. She says, behind every successful child is an astonished parent. And uh, I just want you all to know you all are astonishingly good uh, in, in your advocacy. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep working. And when we get this done, let's pick up the next issue and the next issue, because we have got a long way to go uh, to deal with a lot of the inequities we're, that are facing women in this country uh, and that are facing uh, uh, birthing people in particular. So. Just grateful. Thank you, fellas. Uh, I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Uh, and uh, Charles, we got to do something about Lexus's overabundance of hair, man. We I gotta, know, man. Listen, he needs to make. We need to get like he needs to do some some crowdsourcing and get us straight. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always we get, get us straight. I hope there's not a hazing ritual here where I get my head shaved. <laughs> <laughs> we Charles and I are going to come on and do an AMA on uh, grooming techniques. Seriously. Ask me anything about how to shave your head. All right. Listen, seriously, simple. <laughs> No, if we could, if we could raise some money for a good cause, I would do it.
Oh my God! Ooh. You heard it here. Right everybody, now. everybody I, heard I, that, right? Wait, this is not being Everybody recorded. heard that. Oh, this is live, ah, Alexis. This ah, is live. Ah, it's a done deal. I bet you can raise a lot of good money for a good cause. All right. Well, this is. All right. There will be part two. There will be. We'll look for. We'll look for version two of this. I, I'm not, uh, I'm home like, alone. I mean, too. You're, you're a handsome guy. It's gonna work for you. Thanks, man. It's gonna work I, for you, man. You got a good face. You got a good face. All right. I'll be more aerodynamic. All right. <laughs> Kamala Harris okay. is now regretting she put the three of us together, but we're going to cause some good trouble here soon. Good. All right. Thanks, us. fellas. Thanks, gentlemen. We really you know. appreciate you. Thanks, More than you know. You're you. light workers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.